Hi, friends. Welcome to the Barrier Nation podcast, where we support the bariatric community with humor, humility, and honesty. If you are watching this episode, you know this is starting off a little bit different than every other one we've ever recorded. It's just me. And the reason I'm coming to you is to let you know that this episode was not actually the one that we wanted to drop today. We had a different one in mind, but life has a way of throwing us curveballs and pausing and pivoting as a part of this bariatric journey. So the episode that you're about to hear is Jason's revisional story. He's gonna share with you and with all of us why he made the decision to have a revisional surgery. When he had his original procedure, he swore he was never gonna have another bariatric surgery. This was it, he was having one and done and that would be the end of it. But as many of us discover along our bariatric journey, life has a very interesting way of delivering us these surprise moments. And just because we've had bariatric surgery doesn't mean that we will not continue to experience health issues, that we will go through grief and loss along our journey, that the road ahead is actually really unpaved for us. Surgery kind of has this way to magically help us believe that it's going to be the only thing that we need. And then life continues to happen and we realize it's not the only thing that we need. Surgery is not enough. We need to continue to onboard new treatments to continue to treat our lifelong and chronic disease of obesity. And Jason's story is no different. So when we thought about what we were going to do when life threw all of us, Jason, Natalie, and I, these curveballs, how are we going to tackle it? How are we going to manage it? How are we going to pause and pivot? So we're pausing and we're pivoting to Jason's revisional story. There will be time for us to share what we really wanted to share originally on this day. But really, I think this episode is the best way for us to start off 2024. For us and in Berry Nation, it's all about expanding. We have to not only grow along this bariatric journey, but really expand. And the difference between those two words really comes down to intentionality. Growth is something that we are just naturally supposed to do. We as humans grow from teeny tiny little humans to full on adults, right? But that growth is just implied, it's natural. When we expand, we're being intentional about onboarding new treatments or learning new things or having different conversations so that we really do expand into areas that we didn't think possible. Expansion is about really onboarding something with intentionality and then using that new learning, that new tool in very focused and intentional ways. That's what we plan to do this year in Berry Nation is deliver this expansive knowledge so that you yourself can not only grow, but expand in all of the areas that you need to as a bariatric patient and as a human. Jason's doing that in his revisional journey. I'm doing that in my personal life. Natalie's doing the exact same thing. So we thought, this is probably a really great episode to actually start the year off. So we hope you enjoy it. We are excited to hear your feedback. Uh, and just know, right on the surface, this episode is about Jason's revision. But below the surface, it's about how we're all learning to expand as bariatric patients and humans as we move along our bariatric journeys. Happy listening, friends. Hi, welcome to the Berry Nation podcast, where we support the bariatric community with humor, humility, and honesty. I'm April. I'm Jason. I'm Natalie. Today, my friends, you are in for a treat. We are launching a new Berry Nation series within the Berry Nation podcast called The Revisionists. Both Nat and Jason have been through or are going through a revisional surgery from their original bariatric procedure. Now it's actually had two revisions. Jason is going in for, for one here soon. So many members of our community currently or in the past or looking ahead are going in for revision surgeries. And we've been having some really awesome conversations with our medical experts and friends. And we just thought, you know what? These stories need to be shared with the world. I think there's a lot of connotation that comes with the word revision, with the concept of having a bariatric uh, revisional surgery, and we just want to address it as openly and, and honestly as we can. So we are going to be utilizing this series to share the stories and experiences of patients who are going through or who have had revisional surgery. 
And y'all know, I always like to, we always like to make sure that we're kind of starting with the same, same definition. We're speaking the same language. So I went to professor Google and I just typed in define a revisionist. A revisionist is a person with a revised attitude to a previously accepted situation or point of view. Nat, you have had to revise your understanding of your current bariatric situation twice, right? Jason, you are entering this this period of of accepting and and revising your your own understanding of of surgery. Uh, So today we are embracing the revisionist mindset, and we are going to just give you two space to talk about your your revision story and and how you arrived at the place where you knew this was something that, that you needed to do. So if you guys are ready, I say, let's just dive in. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Miss Nat, you are the first one out of our trio who had a revision surgery. Will you just walk us through kind of the the, the big overview? Give us the 20,000 foot view of why you had revision surgery, not once, but twice. Yeah. So I was always obese growing up. Um, literally from birth, I was an obese baby. I was an obese child. And then I was an obese preteen and teenager. Um, by the time I was 14, I had been in Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig. I had done the South Beach diet, done, you name it, I had done it. Um, at age 15, I was 350 pounds. And I spoke with my mom and my pediatrician, that's how young I was, um, about my options. And at the time, this was 2009, uh, my pediatrician suggested we look into bariatric surgery, which at the time I really had two options of gastric bypass or the lap band and the lap band was suggested. Um, so 2009, um, I think it was August of 2009, I had my lap band, I was wildly successful. I was so young. Like I didn't have loose skin. I just kind of lost the weight and I felt good and I was active and it just kind of fell off. Um, And then I eventually experienced some complications where I could not, um, I couldn't eat. If I did eat, uh, I would immediately uh, throw it up. Um, I couldn't keep anything down. And then so I was resorting to protein shakes or milk and water. Like that was pretty much all I could eat. Um, and I didn't speak up. I didn't know anything about my options. There was not really a lot of support. I was 16 at the time. All these factors uh, come into play then as well. Um, until eventually I lost too much weight, right? So my highest weight at the time was 350 pounds. I actually got all the way down to 126 pounds, um, which is, if you know me, I am five foot seven. Uh, that is a very low weight <laughs> for my body. Um, and I, it was to the point where I, I was not well, I was blatantly not well. I couldn't keep things down and I was throwing up even if I hadn't eaten, um, was rushed to the emergency room, had an emergency removal, uh, in 2010, or I think it was the very beginning of 2011, like January holidays-ish time. Um, That was the worst day of my life. Uh, I was, I remember begging the surgeon not to take out my band uh, because all of these fears, right? Of like, I don't want to go back. This saved my life, even though it was quite literally killing me. Um, They removed it. Good thing they don't listen to 17 year old girls. Um, (laughs) And then uh, a year later, I started getting gaining my weight back, which in hindsight, I should have been um, gaining the weight back. Um, But my I was scared. My, uh, you know, parents were concerned. My doctor was concerned. So I went back to my surgeon and uh, we did the placation, which they don't really do anymore. It's um, they don't remove your stomach, but they kind of fold it and suture it into a sleeve shape. Um, and I remember, uh, feeling like, okay, this is at least going to keep me where I'm at. Um, it did not, I did not feel any restriction. Um, I could eat as I did 
before any of my surgeries. Um, and that's really where I gained all of my weight back and then some, I thought I'd failed. I know we'll get into this a little bit more, uh, about that mindset. Um, fast forward about eight, eight ish years. Um, I decided to try it one more time, <laughs> have, give it one more go. Um, my insurance was not covering my, uh, procedures, uh, because of the psych, psych evaluations, um, I'd gone through several rounds of trying to get insurance to pay for it. Um, and then finally my mom found my surgeon in Mexico, um, obesity control center. And I just decided, you know, let's do it. I have nothing to lose and started my, uh, VSG pre-op diet, uh, July 1st of 2020. And, and then finally had my surgery in September of 2020. So, it's been a long journey, a long road, um, but I've really been, I've, I've been through it all, feels like. <laughs> we would agree. You have definitely been through, been through it all, right? And over really decades of your life too, when, and especially, I don't think I knew your lowest weight, that, that is a really shockingly no low number just for me based on, yeah, you know, knowing you for all these years, but wow. Okay. Yeah. And you and I, April, we're fairly similar in our, our body types, um, yeah. um, our body shapes. You're maybe an inch taller than me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember stepping on the scale one day and seeing that number. Like I actually remember seeing that number out of all the numbers that I've been. And I kind of remember being like, ooh, even as a teenager, kind of being like, mm, that's odd. Like I should, I don't feel like I should be that mm -hmm. number. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was kind of the first sign. And then that's when my complications came. Um, but nothing, nothing before that was alarming, but I remember seeing that number and being like, huh, that's, that's a very low number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I remember saying that to myself, that's a pretty low number. What's what's happening here. But yeah, well, very, I was very thin. And it, it's interesting, and I would imagine there are a lot of bariatric patients out there who who know two numbers that concern them. Maybe their their pre surgery weight, their high weight, and then right. Sometimes people need revisions because they have lost too much weight, or there are complications going on that are driving their weight so low. So for you to very clearly be able to identify those two numbers as like the the, the bookends, if you will, to your bariatric journey. That's, that's huge. And I think a lot of people don't think about getting too low when it comes to bariatric surgery, but it is a reason for, for revision sometimes and complications. Mm -hmm. Dang, dang. All right. Jason, my friend, how about you? Well, like when, when Natalie was explaining, she, you know, I, I'm someone who was fortunate enough to not have always been heavy. My weight issue started with health issues in 2007. So I would say even back as far as like to even 2006, I was probably around the 235 to 250 mark, kind of bouncing back and forth. And to be 6'4", to be 250 is not, you know, not shockingly overweight. So I didn't have issues until I realized that my thyroid had gone out and a bunch of other things had kind of happened all at one time, this perfect storm of stuff that made me gain about 130 pounds in roughly seven months, eight months. It all just piled on really fast. And then as time went on and I, we were trying to get medications, you know, to level out and things to happen, like none of that was working. So of course the bigger I got, the less mobile I was. And, you know, everything just kind of progressed from that point until, you know, about, eight, like I said, eight years ago, we moved here to Florida. And then I really was really having trouble with movement and also not eating, you know, near as what I, as healthy as I should have been. And then, you know, perfect, perfect storm turned into the perfect nightmare of me hitting my highest weight of, you know, 400, probably my highest unrecorded weight is somewhere in the 470 to 475 range, but highest recorded was 468. And then going into my consultation with my bariatric surgeon, they let me know ahead of time, one surgery is not going to do it. The sleeve is not going to fix what you have going on with you. So we will have to take like the sleeve is going to get you where we can safely operate on you to do a bypass. And 
I remember thinking about it at the time saying, no, no, you don't know me and what I can do. So I will just take this one. Thank you. And I will be fine. And because in my head, I never wanted bypass in the first place. But he told me he, he told me that I was too high risk for bypass. My age and my weight made me out of the realm for bypass at the time. So as we go on through learning more about that, like he asked me first, he's like, you want sleep or bypass? I'm like, you're the one with the white coat. I don't know. Like, I, I came to you for help. Like, how am I supposed to know what I want? I don't know. Mm. And that's when he let me know, like, well, one, this other one's not going to work for you based on your chart, your, you know, your medical history, all the things like you need to have the sleep first. And I, like I said, I mean, I was not shopping for bypass whatsoever. So I, in talking to them, you know, he said that the PA said it, everybody let me know, like, well, you know, this will get you, this will get you close, but you know, they will have to do something else to get you where you really need to be. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that's fine. So March 11th, 2020, I have the sleeve and I, I mean, I lost, I, I did fairly well with all of the steps. Like I lost 45 pounds on the liquid diet before I even had the surgery, then started just dropping the weight, dropping the weight. And from, you know, 470 and, and probably what, or 478, I think I was just, I, like I said, 45 pounds before. And so surgery weight then lost down to within the first probably, I want to say 18 months, lost down to 295. They did the liquid diet with Sarah for her surgery, my wife, and then dropped another, I don't know, I, I got down to two, like 278, I think was the lowest I'd gotten down uh, when on the liquid, the second round of the liquid diet with her. And then the minute I sniffed real food, it just started going back up. So I was back at 295, like with no, without hardly any, like one meal, I'm probably back at 295. And the next thing you know, 295 is not holding anymore. Then I go up and then I go up and up and up. And I'm now, as I said today, I'm at 351. So from 295 being my lowest regular normal, like doing everything to plan weight to 351, as I say here, I struggled very hard. So when I thought I, you know, I really got scared and thought, Oh shit, it's never going to stop. And I'm just going to keep going until I'm back at my highest weight again. Well, then it didn't go anywhere. So 351 is like, I've been there for nine months, no matter what I do, no matter what happens, how I adjust things, what I macros, walking, active activity levels, going to the gym, none of that matter. Like it 350s in. So, I mean, I think I've hit like 348 a couple times, 346, and then I go right back to 350 a couple days later when my body's like, ah, what are you doing? He yanks the set point back up on me. But honestly, it, it, you know, much like, you know, a lot of people in our community that I'm finding out when I've been talking to them is I did not feel like I deserved a revision because I felt like I had made the mistakes that led me back to 350. And that's just, it was just going to be what it was. And, you know, I, I explained to you guys when we were, you know, had, had a couple of separate little meetings, you know, private meetings that it wasn't really until my body started giving up again, that I realized that I was not going to be able to continue to live like this. Cause I, I had tried to just resign myself to the fact that 350 was as good as it was going to get. And I was just going to be this forever. And then when the comorbidity started coming back, the knees started hurting again, the ankles, the hips, the joints, all the joint pain, all the, you know, the trouble sleeping again, I'm not sleeping as well as I could. Like the numbers on the CPAP are going up, up and up like my activity levels per hour are raising. And I'm just not, then I started really feeling just bad. I don't like, like I told you, like day to day, I just feel horrible. Like I can't take enough medicine to make it feel better. Like I just end up in a constant state of just not feeling well at all across the board. And I, I realized that this isn't what I did this for. I wasn't, I didn't, you know, we say we didn't come this far just to come this far. And I legitimately had that mindset. I was like, I can't continue to live like this. Like, I've got to find out if really if what I did was my mistake or if there's something else that could be more, you know, some, some, another another explanation for what's going on. 
So I had to dig deeper and, and, and figure out. And once I talked to, uh, to Dr. Cribbins, it let, he let me know in no uncertain terms that, you know, he would send me for testing and things and that it wasn't my fault. And there was plenty of things that could be, you know, the, the reason as to why, because it wasn't until we talked about my capacity as to what led him to realize that there was bigger problems. And when, when we were sitting at the just, just for you awards and when, you know, Heather went and got everybody, all they offered pretty much for food were like little burgers that people could have. Anyway. So Heather got everybody one that we could split. And so when Sarah split ours, she's like, I know this isn't going to be enough, but for now it's just, it'll be for now. It's cool. Like, it. and Joe looked at her and was like, what do you mean? And Heather's kind of watching and like, they're looking at each other, looking at me. And I said, Oh, I said, my capacity is much higher than most anybody I know that has had surgery. And he goes, well, like how, how explain to me what you mean. And I was like, well, <laughs> I was like, if I haven't eaten a lot that day, I was like, at any meal, I was like, I can sit down and have a 10 ounce steak. I was like, and if I eat the whole steak, I can only have, you know, like maybe a couple of pieces of broccoli and and maybe a spoonful of potatoes when I'm done. And he's looking at me with his face like, huh? And, and I, he's like, yeah, that's not right. I was like, I know. I was like, I'm aware. I said, and I've had this problem. I said, I can also drink like eight to 10 ounces of water at a time with no problem. And he's like, uh, yeah, no, that's not okay. And I was like, yeah, I know. I was like, but you know, it is what it is. I was like, this is just what it's going to be. I was like, because I don't want bypass. And he goes, so, and I was like, well, that's all I can have. And he goes, said who? I was like, my surgeon in Florida. And he goes, that's not right either. And I was like, oh, then he starts explaining that there's other options. And I'm like, that's what led me to kind of explore what those options are. Mm -hmm. And for, for those of you listening or watching and wondering, like, why would Jason's capacity be larger than what even he was anticipating? When surgeons perform a vertical sleeve gastrectomy, right, they're, they're looking to remove a certain percentage of your stomach, but there's no magic formula or tool out there that allows a surgeon to take the exact same amount of stomach from every single person because everybody's anatomy is different. So <clears throat> the goal is, is is that they would take 70 to 80%, but sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes they miscalculate, it's misjudged, right? So everybody's you know, internal surgery is going to look different. But I can remember Jason, when we went to Ohio, I think for the Renew event, you and I were sitting next to each other eating breakfast. And, and even at that time you said, you know, you told me, you said, I'm actually kind of worried about my sleeve because my capacity is, is bigger than what I was thinking it would be. And I can remember you felt bad about it. And at the time you were like, I've stretched it out. And I remember vividly having this conversation with you. I was like, Jason, we've talked to how many surgeons, we've had this conversation 8,000 times, you cannot stretch your stomach out. It's not gonna get bigger. And that was when the light kind of went on for you. And I think for me, just saying it out loud, it was like, you just have a bigger pouch. Like your, your capacity is bigger, but the conversation that we also had was you saying exactly that. Well, I'm also not doing the things that I know I need to do. You instantly went to, this is a me, 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 me problem. Instead of continuing that conversation about biology, about the disease of obesity, about how it continues, about all that stuff, you very much internalized it. And it's kind of you to say that, you know, we've talked about this in meetings. no, Nat and I abscond you every single time we're together or on a private Zoom. And we're like, <laughs> what is going on with you? What is wrong with you? What? Why are you not? Something is wrong. Something is wrong. And it literally took us forcing you on a fun vacation into a conversation. Where we're like, no, you are not well. What the freak is going on? So let's call a spade a spade. We straight up hounded your ass until you gave up the ghost, which was- We did. Yeah. You were terrified about your weight reoccurrence and you didn't know what to do. And I don't mean to put words in your mouth, uh, but you were also terrified about what the community would think of you because you're the person that supports and now you're experiencing weight reoccurrence and you don't know what to do about it. No, and I, I want to, I wanted to circle back to, to what you said, April, about the factors of, because Jason, I, 
my situation is so similar to yours in, in a different way, but, uh, and I forgot this piece, but it's very, uh, poignant to my, my story is, um, you know, I go all 10, almost 10 years, right. Gaining all my weight back. I got up to 403 pounds as my highest recorded weight. I come out of surgery and the surgeon comes to me and says, did you know that two thirds of your sutures have come undone? Well, that's why I didn't lose weight. That's why I gained all the weight back and then some. There are factors that happen. And sometimes, yeah, it is our own, you know, I'm eating pastries or I'm, eat, you know, I'm I'm not doing, oh, shit. Sorry, I just, we can cut that out. Um, <laughs> I, you know, there are times where, we are not following our plan that in itself does not cause us to gain 50 to a hundred pounds back. That is not what causes us to gain 50 to a hundred pounds back. What happens are other factors, our obesity disease comes back. Something did not go correctly or to plan with our surgery. And these are the reasons why these conversations are so powerful and so important because we need to ask the questions and we need to take that initiative to say something's not right and I need to figure out what it is. Well, and, and also like what you had said, it's it's very important that people understand that following plan 100% is not is not an option. Like nobody nobody follows a plan to 100%. We, we're, we play the law of averages in this game where it is if you're doing right the majority of the time, that's what we're looking for. Majority is 51%. So 51% of the time you're doing it. And those times that you aren't eating on plan don't negate your worth for having the conversation about a revision. Do not internalize like I did and think that you don't deserve a revision or to speak to anybody about a revision or that anybody's going to look at you crazy because guess what? It's an adjunct treatment. It's another tool to add to the toolbox that is an option. If it wasn't needed, it wouldn't be an option. Like they wouldn't even have it. So, you know, I, when we figured out with mine, what they found was that my doctor only, my original surgeon was only able to get out about 55% of my original stomach maybe like between 55 and 60%. And how, you know, Dr. Cribbins explained it was, is in somebody my size, when you are manually performing the sleeve surgery with, with hands instead of the, the robot, it's very hard to get in certain places to get as much as you need to, as well as the top of the stomach that comes just off of the esophagus to your stomach can also be left a little wider than normal, which is what happened to me. So I have extra, I have added capacity in the top of my stomach as well as the sleeve that I have left. So that accounts for my ability to drink as much water as I can at a time and eat and those things. So a lot of it you know, that what I was so concerned about really and, and punishing myself for, for as much as I, I, I probably should have had the revision by now. I've been almost a year out from that. Had I, you know, had not punished myself for, you know, thinking that I did all the things wrong, but you live and you learn, you do the things. So as of now, it, it I will be having a revision on December 12th of 2023. And I'm super excited. Yes. And you are going from a vertical sleeve gastrectomy VSG to a SADI, which is a combination of kind of like a, a, a well, a sleeve and, and a bypass. So they're going to re-sleeve and then they bypass a part of your system. And really this is, it's a new, newer procedure. Um, it, it's done robotically. Um, and the reason that it's becoming very popular is it kind of offers the best of both worlds. It's, it's, um, it's the best part of the sleeve and it's the best part of the bypass combined into one procedure. It is a very complicated procedure. It definitely takes a skilled team and equipment and, you know, and all that kind of stuff to do. Um, but the, the chances of having some of the complications that you could have for sleeve or some of the complications for bypass are eliminated because of how this surgery is, is performed. Yes, and, and that, that's what's what got me so excited about it in the first place is the fact that I so I'm getting kind of a two for one. I'll be getting the resleeve, which is putting me down to where I should have been in the first place, and then the Sadie, which how Dr. Kirby's explained to me, like what you had said, it's the best of both worlds. And I just don't have the the connection of the tissues with the Sadie is much more 
it's much more aligned to how the the tissues are supposed to be so they can get along so it cuts out the ulcerative and the, the ulcerative issues the GERD issues all those types of things that people some, sometimes see with bypass so I'm, I'm pretty super excited about the whole thing yeah and if if you are listening or you're watching this conversation and you are worried that maybe you will have to have a revision or it's something that that you are concerned about or you're worried about weight reoccurring after surgery I, I was looking at my phone go listen to episode 168 of the Variation podcast it's understanding bariatric re revisions when and why it's necessary with dr cribbins and dr chen in that episode, they so clearly and beautifully articulate why patients who do everything right are still going to experience weight reoccurrence, other, other issues related or not related to their bariatric surgery, and may need a revision. It's so important as patients that we know, even if we do everything 100% right, which isn't anything we can ever actually do, we are still going to experience bumps along the road of our bariatric journey. Weight reoccurrence is just something that happens to every patient. Weight reoccurrence beyond that 5 or 10% threshold, that is where we really start getting into the realm of more treatment is needed. And revisional surgery can be a treatment option that, that is available to people because, right, Jason, like is what you said. We kind of have one of two choices when we reach this point in our bariatric journey, if, if we do get there. Uh, it could be because of weight reoccurrence. It could be the, the reappearance of co comorbidities, right? The, the list for why we need surgery could, could be great. But if you're internalizing it and, and you believe this is 100% my fault, I'm such a horrible person, I did this to myself, I don't deserve more treatment. That is not going to be a mindset that is that is going to serve you at, at all. And being a revisionist, you really do need to adopt this new viewpoint on something that, that you thought was never possible. So that's kind of the next question I want to ask you guys. And Nat, we'll have you go first. But how did you get to the point in your mind that you accepted revision surgery would be a part of your bariatric journey? I, I had two moments. Um, the first moment, uh, was 20, 2017, 2018 ish. Um, and I was not at my highest weight yet. Um, and that's where I started the, uh, the journey of insurance hoops twice. I went through that, that hoop, uh, twice. And I was going through a lot in my life. I had just moved, done a major life move. My grandma's health was declining. I mean, there were a lot of factors in my life that were affecting me. So looking back, I understand why they denied me. Um, but I remember thinking I'm gaining all this weight. Like Jason said, I don't feel good. Um, I can't, I feel like I'm in a rut. I just felt really stuck. And like, I was digging, like digging a hole instead of moving forward. And, um, so I, I started those, um, those journeys got kind of kicked down really. Um, and then decided, you know what, kind of again to what Jason said, I'm just going to be obese forever. I'm just going to be this weight forever. So I'm just going to live my life. I was at 25, you know, I thought I'm just going to live my life to the fullest and do whatever I want, wear whatever I want, eat whatever I want and not stress about it. And I think that for me was really pivotal. Uh, I was young. I just wanted to have fun and I allowed myself to do that. However, in the same vein, I was killing myself. I was eating huge portions of food. I wasn't active. Um, I was depressed. And um, two years later, my grandma passed away. She Her health declined very rapidly. And we were going through her life through photos and people telling stories. And, of, and my grandma's done a million things amazing things. She's traveled. She's um, done things for the community. She, you know, she was very active. She's a very active person. And um, I remember sitting around the table looking 
at all of these pictures, hearing all these stories and thinking, well, shit, I can't do any of this at the weight that I am. There's no way. I can't go to Mexico at age 70 and outwalk a 30 year old. I can't travel Europe in my you know, late sixties with my best friend. I can't be there for my grandkids. Um, you know, just all of these things that like she was able to do because she was healthy and happy and took care of herself. Um, and so I really, that was a wake, wake up point for me was like, I just want to be able to live a good, long, healthy life, be there for my family and do the things that I want to do in a healthy way. Um, and it took that, it took that time that I took to just do whatever I wanted to realize that that was not beneficial for me, but I had been living 25 years of my life adhering to diets, you know, hating my body, never feeling like I was good enough. And I just needed that, that all or nothing thinking that we talk about all the time. It's just like, I just had to go to the other side of the pendulum for a minute to realize, no, I need to be down here in the middle. It's like the story of bariatric life. It is right. It, it is that big <laughs> swing. We were just talking about this earlier in an, in an interview that, that we did with, with somebody, right. But it is that all or nothing thinking um, we can drive us one way or the other before surgery. And a lot of times after surgery, we find that, right, we go all in bariatric and that pendulum is just, woo, it is way over here. And there is no space for anything other than bariatric, but then we get burnt out and we think that, um, you know, we go into surgery thinking, oh, I'm going to lose all this weight, check off this box, and then I'm done. And then I'm going to move on with my life until we realize, oh my God, this is my life there, there, right? Like, I'm burnt out of this. I don't want to do it anymore, but I can. Then we go back over here where we're just resolved to like, I'm just going to live how I was doing it before. I'm not going to bariatric anymore. Forget this. I'm done. I'm over it. But we realize that we we never find happiness, contentment at either extremes anymore. It just doesn't work. It's always that. Oh, yep. okay. Yeah. Right. I, yeah, I had to find I had to find the both extremes again after I mean, I'm three years post op, I had to find those extremes again. And I feel like just I just crossed that three year mark. And I feel like I'm just starting to find that happy medium down at the mm -hmm. bottom, down mm -hmm. in the middle, um, where I can breathe a little bit lighter. Um, I can, you know, move about my bariatric life with confidence in most respects, in some respects, I'm still learning, which is good. Um, but it, 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 it was that pendulum swing that really, it, it kept happening for, for a long, long, for my whole life. And then again, in bariatrics, and that really sucked. I remember talking to, to the both of you and just being like, what the hell do I, what do I do? What I can't get to this happy medium spot. And, um, it does happen. And I'm so excited um, for you, Jason, and, and a lot of members, Berry Nation members that I've talked to about revisions, because this really is, um, it's another chapter. And this time is different because you have all of these, um, these amazing tools. Mm -hmm. well, I was going to say, you know, the, the thing that has really stayed, I think, constant especially with with both of where you're at right now it it is community you have both leaned into community in in your own respective ways but that is what i think helps you stay in the mindset that i might not understand or have it figured out now but i will right you know that 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 you will figure it out at some point you just have it's just it's that faith right the community gives you that faith to know that uh, i can figure that that out Jason, what, what about you? What, what really led you to the point where you made the decision or acknowledged really that a revision would be in your future? It it was really like I said, talking to, talking to Dr. Gribbins at the, at the Just Be You Awards when he let me know, I was hopeful probably a, a month or so before that, because when I really started kind of figuring out that I, how bad off I was, like how I was re like really started listening to my body and realizing that the, the, the pain was really so persistent that I had a very hard time 
doing regular things and I was losing mobility in, in certain aspects again. And it just, it hit me like a ton of bricks to think that, you know, that I, I wasn't going to continue to live like this. I may not be 468 pounds, but I feel like it. And mm-hmm. that's not okay either. Mm-hmm. So really in, in really had gotten real strong feelings about possibly changing my mind and thinking if we're, you know, if revision to bypass was the only way I had to do something because what I was doing currently wasn't right. So I, I, Sarah, Sarah, my wife was really instrumental in when she, we were talking about it. She was like, well, I guess we can just call our surgeon back at that. And I, and I stopped and I was like, absolutely not. I was like, I, I'm not because if we have the opportunity to speak with so many amazing doctors and nutritionists and experts in our community, I'm going to lean on them. I would rather lean on them and find out what's what and, and go that route. Because honestly, this is where advocating for yourself is extremely important. If there's something that you feel that would be better for you, sometimes you have to fire your surgeon and go somewhere else. Like I'm now traveling from Florida to Dallas to have my revision because I, I didn't want to hear what my doctor had to say. Like my surgeon only had that one, you know, that that one that one option to bypass. And he didn't even want to explore or talk about anything else. And that's okay. If if that works for him, that's cool. For me, that wasn't what I needed. So I, you know, I chose to talk to Dr. Cribbins, which is now, you know, taking me to Dallas. And luckily he accepted my insurance and everything went through. Um, So yeah, I'm I'm just, it, it really took that for me to, to realize that not only did I want better for myself to have the, you know, to, to go ahead and have the revision itself, but I wanted to go ahead and I, and I wanted better for myself and the options I had. So I went and, and went to seek out those options. I mean, the, there, I mean, there's a lot of similarities in your story, both of your stories, but what continues to come up to the surface is that you really reach this like breaking point or, or maybe you, you just reach this point of acceptance. Right. And it was like, this is, this is what it's going to be. But at the same time, you, uh, it was almost like that was the new low for you. And once you were able to get to that, that low point, that rock bottom, were you really able to definitively say, no, I, I am not willing to accept this. I'm not willing to stay here. Something is wrong. I need more treatment. Something is not right. Right. Like for whatever it was, that spark of life really became strong again and you were both able to lean into that and advocate for yourself and for your desire to continue to pursue a life that you knew was possible for you just a little bit beyond reach right i mean not you went all the way to mexico for yours right i mean jason you're going all the way to texas so <laughs> that's that, that's a lot of traveling to 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 get the the care that you need I think really what, um, what it is, is that we hit that acceptance, but it's acceptance out of defeat, exhaustion, and shame. (laughs) It's not, it's not like an acceptance, like, ah, I feel good here. It's like, well, this is what it is. Like you look around, you say, I've been kicked down. I've I feel lost. I feel ashamed because I've gained all my weight back. It, it's not an acceptance because you are content. It's an acceptance because you're freaking exhausted. <laughs> and you're like, I just want to live my life. But deep down at the core, and I don't want to speak for you, Jason, at the core, it's like, you know, that's that's not where you want to be, but you don't know how to, you don't know what else to do. You're like, well, okay, I guess this is where I'm supposed to be. And it's, it's interesting that's it. that that you say that because I've, I've learned to, I've learned to get really good at, at like, I guess, understanding when I've made a decision that's right for me. And I always describe it as like, okay, fine. I just make a decision. I pick one. And then I just sit with it. And usually it involves, you know, sleep, having one night of sleep on, on whatever this big decision is. But if I wake up the next morning and that decision bounces back up, 
right? If, if my body, if my internal whatever, right, is all of a sudden like, eh, are you sure? That's how I know that was not the right decision. And it sounds like for both of you guys, right, when you just got to the place where it's like, this is, it is what it is. I'm going to be 400 pounds. I'm going to 350. Like, I'm just, I'm just, this is what it's going to be. That decision, right? Even though it wasn't your decision, but you know, you just kind of coming to that definitive statement bounced back up for both of you. And you guys were like, no, right. The, if this is what it is, then why am I feeling like this is not what it should be? You really were able to listen to your intuition and tap into that, that hopefulness and that faith and that, that belief that there, there, it, there are more options for you. Oh yeah, no, exactly how, how Nat, explained it like it is a forced acceptance which is the worst kind of acceptance because it's not truly an acceptance it's one that you're force fed and you're like well shit i guess yeah i guess i will just sit here because this is all i got only option i have so you know i'm just gonna sit in it and it sucks and uh like it it was legitimately i almost want to say this was lower than my low point at my heaviest weight if it wouldn't have been for the college trip and the story that i tell about that that like mm -hmm. legitimately just me being 470 this this was a lower low than that, specifically because of the fact that I thought this was it. Like I was going to do this. I was going to rock this. I wasn't going to have any problems. This was going to answer all my prayers, all my hopes, my dreams. Everything was going to come true. And then it did. not And then I'm like, fuck, like, what am I going to do now? Like, I'm not going to be able to go back and do this all shit, all this shit again. Like I did it once. I don't have any other options. So I guess I'm just screwed. And yet you persisted, right? So, so, something in you. And, and thank goodness, right? Both of you guys did do that because everybody really deserves to, 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 to treat a disease that is severely hampering their ability to, to live their best life. And, you know, Nat and I knew something was wrong. We knew something was really, really, really wrong. And, um, even as close as we are, the three of us are, it still took you a solid year to just be able to articulate it. Um, which I, I think again, is a really powerful testimony to the power of friendships, the power of community, the power of having people who understand in your corner that will push you a little bit beyond your boundaries or are your safe place to go and say, okay, this is actually what I'm really struggling with. But if you don't have that, if you're just keeping it in, inside, you're internalizing it, right? And you're telling yourself these things that aren't true. If you're telling yourself, this is all my fault. I'm a horrible person. I did something wrong. None of those statements are true. But the more that you tell them just to yourself and they stay in here, the louder and more believable it is going to get until you find yourself on an island all by yourself. And that's not where we want anybody to be. Well, and, it, and it's hard because we will beat ourselves up more than anyone else will. So getting it out as quick as you can will only help you to dissect exactly what you're feeling. Because that was the problem for me. I didn't want to admit that I hurt. I didn't want to admit that I was struggling. I didn't want to admit that, you know, most of the pants that I have didn't fit. Most of the outfits I wanted to wear to the things that we were doing didn't fit. So I had to come up with different outfits and all the, you know, all the things that I was telling myself, you know, that I would tell other people. And then, you know, while all the while while being horrible to myself inside my head. And then it wasn't until legitimately when I finally poured it all out to you guys, like I was a mess in public. And like, I didn't give a shit. Like I just, I had to let it go at that point. Cause I, I would have been holding it in for so long when I finally figured out what it was. Cause then, you know, part of that time was I did not think that I had it. I thought I was cool. Like I didn't think anything was wrong. Nobody yeah. was going to know the difference because I was just so good at hiding all of my shit, which we all know now it's not true. But no. I just like, I didn't, I couldn't really put any, I couldn't put a, a label on it early on. And it wasn't really until like probably May or so when I really figured out what was going on. So it kind of drug on and drug on. And then by the time I finally let you guys know what it was, I just fell apart because I had been holding on. Like Sarah didn't even know. Like I wasn't, even, I wasn't telling anyone. I didn't trust anyone with my dirty little secret that I was in horrible, constant pain all the time. And my shit was falling apart again. And I felt like I was at, you know, a 470 again. Um, 
and I just sat on it that hard because I was so afraid of what everybody else would say. Well, because you were brave enough to share this conversation right with with us and now the world other people are not going to feel so alone other people are going to kind of know some steps that they can take uh when when, when they're trying to figure it out and and again like um, you know just based on the conversations that we've had with you jason and and not just from your personal experience it it's okay if you don't know exactly how to articulate what you're feeling. It's okay if you don't have the words or the the descriptors or the feelings or the emotions. That doesn't matter. What matters is that you start talking about what you think you're feeling with somebody. It doesn't matter that you don't know exactly what it is, right? Because I think, Jason, if you would have been able to come to us and be like, you know, this is actually really this is weighing on my heart, or I feel like I'm a horrible person because of this. And you were able to do so a little bit at the first JBY, but I didn't understand that. I, I didn't understand the depth to which you were, you were feeling this and we're all really close with, with one another. Um, right. So just to give yourself permission to start these conversations with people that you trust without having all of the details figured out could actually help you get to this decision making point sooner rather than rather than later. Yeah, it's it's worth having the conversation with yourself, true, honest, hard conversation, because just start like you said, just starting to speak to someone about it, somebody you trust. You can reach out to me. You can reach out to April. You can reach out to Nat. You can reach out to the Barry Nation page. I, I, it doesn't matter. If you don't trust anybody in your circle to talk about it, you talk to me about it. Like I've had so many people message me saying that they felt more comfortable to talk about it after I said something or, or asking me questions. Welcome. Um, yeah, so like I've had so many people reach out to me and say they don't know how to start the conversation or how how did I get to a point where I felt comfortable to start. And I, it really took, you know, I, I was more than willing to to start talking to people about it. And it really kind of renewed my vigor for everything. And I was back feeling like I did when I was going to have surgery in the first place. I wanted to tell everybody all about it, spread the good word, tell everybody all the things, mm -hmm. because I don't want anybody feeling like I did, especially feeling like I did for a year. Like, there's no reason to sit in shame on this, especially if it's something that you can't even blame on yourself in the first place. So I know it's hard. It's going to feel like you shouldn't. It's going to, you're going to feel like it is your fault. And that is 100% understandable. Uh, it, the feeling may be valid, even though the facts aren't. So that's the hardest part that you have to realize is just because all signs may point that way does not make the signs point the right way. So you just have to realize that talking to somebody about it is really going to be the best thing you can do to start that conversation. Dang. When I, Dang. when I realized how many folks have been through my same, my, my almost exact same journey, you guys, I just talked to another person at retreat uh, in November, exact same story. They were telling me their story and I was like, mm -hmm, yep, I, I did that. I went through this. I did that. I had that surgery. All it takes is a conversation. All it takes is putting it out into the, 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 the void. I know it seems like a void, but people are listening and people are there for you. And I, I'll never forget um, starting to work with April and Jason. And they asked me, what is your intention? for working with us on the East to West podcast. This was three years ago. And I said, I just want people to not feel alone. If my story helps other people feel less alone and like they can tackle the obstacle in front of them, I've done my job. And that's what makes me so excited about starting this this series, being able to, to watch Jason go through his revision in real time, you guys, like this is, this is epic and something that's never been done really, um, in the community. And it's never been done in front of me. I, I mean, I just, these conversations are what get you going and it's like a ripple effect and I could go on forever, but it just, it matters. 
and just say it, just verbalize it. It's, it's not something I think anybody go in. We, I certainly didn't go into bariatric surgery thinking or anticipating a revision would be in my future, but lo and behold, two of my closest friends in the community are revisionists themselves. So it is something to acknowledge. It's okay to talk about. Um, and we are excited to be able to, to have really these, you know, kind of guided grounded conversations about revisions, because it could be something that is in your future. If you are a bariatric patient and we would much rather prepare everybody for, uh, for something Thing that could be coming their way or just educate our community in general. So we are more kind and compassionate to people who continue to struggle with the disease of obesity. We all know surgery is not going to cure the disease. It treats it. And as our life progresses, more treatment is needed. Uh, a, a bariatric revisional surgery could be a part of the treatment plan, right? Kind of as, as simple as that. All right, my friends, Jason, Nat, thank you so much for being willing to share this, this really big part of, of your bariatric lives with, with me and with the rest of the, the community. Um, it's our goal. This is like we said, it's going to be a series. So we're going to be talking with Jason as he goes through his entire really kind of process of having a revision. Natalie is going to be sharing her stories um, of her revision process and, and what's really going to be so powerful about these conversations is that, right, we're going to be able to get really in the moment insight from you, Jason, about like where your head's at, what are you thinking before surgery? And then what, what an honor to see and be a part of however your change is going to play out after surgery. Um, it's just really exciting. Um, and yeah, we're just super thankful that you're willing to, to share it all with us. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> He's saying thank you. There's no safer place to me than you guys in this community as a whole. So I appreciate that. And I, uh, you know, if I, if I can help one person not feel as bad about things, then I'm, I've done my job. Yep. If you have questions about revision surgery or you yourself are a revisionist, if you have had a revision surgery, we would love to connect with you and possibly even invite you on the podcast. But if you have questions, if you have a story to share, please reach out to us. You can email us at hello at berrynation.com. You can send us a message on Instagram. If you're a member of the Berry Nation support community, you've got 8,000 ways of getting in touch with us there. But um, we know that this is an important topic, maybe not talked about as, as much as it should, and we are going to do our best to, to really make sure that we are elevating this topic and this discussion um, as, as a part of the, the greater bariatric community. So thank you so much, you guys. Jason, my friend, you want to take us out? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for allowing me to, to share my story. And that thank you for also for being so brave to share yours as well. Um, to the community, uh, we thank you guys so much for all the likes, the shares, the subscribes, spreading the word, letting people know that we're here, that Barry Nation exists, the community exists, the podcast exists, because we know that there are people out there that haven't heard yet, and they need to know because, you know, help is out there, and we want to help everybody that we can. So thank you guys for that. Don't forget that you can leave ratings on your favorite podcast players, as well as on our YouTube channel. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel as well if you haven't already. Uh, same thing for your favorite podcast player. And just remember at the end of the day, you've got this, we've got you, and we'll see you next time.